Hey chatters, my name is Brendan and today we're going to be talking about Span. Now I am finally getting to this video that our live stream viewers have been asking me to make for hmm, maybe a couple of years now. We have used Span on our stream at occasional points over the years. Span isn't something that's all that new. It came around with early versions of .NET Core and has been in C Sharp since maybe 7 or 8. And Span is one of those things that they added into the language and it, well, kind of flies under the radar because most of us don't have to deal with it. But the reason why I want to make sure that we're talking about it is that .NET 7 is about to come out. And if you've been paying attention to .NET 7, you may have noticed that we're getting lots of performance updates. And if you were paying attention when .NET 6 came out, you may have also noticed there were performance updates. And Microsoft has been continually making performance updates to the dot, to, to .NET. And so I think we should talk about one of the things they added that they started using underneath the hood, and this has added a number of little add-on benefits to the rest of us, because span is very useful. If you ever have to work with strings, say you're splitting them, or you ever have to work with arrays or lists, and you're needing sections of them at a time, and you don't want to create whole new collections of them, then this is the answer. So today, we're going to talk about Span. I mentioned that Span works with strings and arrays and other collections like that. So why do we need a new way of working with strings and collections? We've been able to do this since the beginning of .NET. There have always been collections. Well, let's talk about the string. So specifically, a string in C Sharp, say like this one here, is an immutable object. It is a reference type, which means that we only actually keep on the stack a reference to a point in memory in the heap, and that is where this is stored. What that means is that inside of our, the stack, which is where we are executing our method, that's like the local memory of, of our current context, so right here, we have address. Address is actually just a pointer to some place in the heap and it stores this value. And that's our string. Now, these are immutable. And that means mutability is the essentially the ability to change. So if something is immutable, it cannot change. So since we cannot change this string, what happens if we, say, substring it or concatenate it or anything like that is we allocate an entirely new string and the old one's still there. Now, if when we concatenated it, we assigned the result back into the same variable, we've lost the reference to the original. And it's sitting in the heap, waiting for the garbage collector to come back and get it. Now, when I say come back and get it, I mean it's going to come and clean it up later. And so that's actually something that your processor is going to do. Now, if I were to come in and say address, and then say plus equals, and I said comma hill valley, then essentially what I've done is I have created a new string for address. And we've lost this old one. So our new one is the full 1640 Riverside Drive, Hill Valley, California. And we don't even have the original anymore, but it's still stored in memory. And so what's gonna happen is since we no longer have a pointer to it, the garbage collector is gonna come by and it's gonna clean it up. And awesome, that's great, right? We didn't have to worry about it. I mean, it is from a programming standpoint, but there are some challenges. Because we are doing this potentially lots of times in our programs, we could have a lot of CPU cycles going to that kind of operation. Let's take a different example. Let's say that I want to store the different parts because I want to be able to verify that this address is valid and check it against some system that we've got. I might want to do something a little bit more complicated. So let's say I make string and I say uh, the number maybe the house number, and I set that equal to 1640. So I can say address like this, and I could say from zero to four. And so essentially what that means is start me at index zero and go to the fourth point. So start me here at index zero, go up to four, and that's the string we're gonna get. So this should get me 1640. And then if I wanna get the num the if I want to get the street name, I can say string street name equals address substring 
And for this one, I'm going to want to start at 5. And then I'm going to want to go out how many spaces? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9. Now, if I were doing this in my code, I wouldn't hard code in the substrings. I would just go to the next space uh, in this structure. And that would get that for me. So I could split this on space and it would give me the three pieces. Uh, and I also wouldn't validate it this way. But simple code for an example. The last thing we need is the street type. In this case, our street type is going to be a drive. So that is at 915, it looks like. So we're going to say 15, and that is a length of 5. So this should get us the basic structure. Let's try printing it out. So we'll start off by printing out the address. And then the next thing we're going to print out is the house number, street name, and street type. Now when I run this, I should get the output I expect. So I get 1640 Riverside Drive, 1640 Riverside and Drive. Now, some people might say, yeah, that's totally fine. That works. And for simple cases like this, it does work. But we want to talk about what happens when you're not in the simple case. So let's first off try debugging this instead of just running it. And we'll drop a breakpoint here at the end. So if I come in here and I say debug the project, then we're going to be able to take advantage of some of our tools. We're going to take a look at threads and variables. And as it's running, what I want you to notice is this. I have an address string, an, a house number string, a street number string, and a street type string. And that is four separate strings. So it created a string for each one of these. We don't need that in most cases. So in a lot of cases, when you're just trying to extract the data out like this, especially if you were just trying to verify or look up the value and you weren't going to be using it or storing it anywhere, you don't need a full string keeping track of it. And since the address is not going to change, remember, it's an immutable string. We're not changing that value. If someone were to assign a new address, it would go somewhere else. So even if we changed address, we're not going to lose the value from our span because we're still pointed to the right spot. We are pointed to that. In case that's confusing, I'll explain that memory in a minute. This is awesome. That works great. But how do I do it with a span? So I want to explain kind of what a span is and how it works. A span is usually explained as a window, and that's a little confusing, but the analogy works. So let's explain. This value, as we mentioned, is stored on the heap. And this is actually just a pointer. So if you've worked with a lower level language, you know that they tend to have pointers pointing to values, stored places, and that our high level languages like C Sharp sort of hide that away from us so we don't have to deal with it. But they're still there. And the language is using them. A span sort of gives us a little bit more control over the pointer and works the same way. When we create a new span, we're going to point at this same address. And when we do that, what's going to happen is we're going to point at this address, but we're going to tell it how, what section of this data we're looking at. And that's kind of how the span works. So we're going to have, it's described as a window because we have a window into this string essentially, or other collection. If we were to use an array, we can do the same thing. But we have in a, a window that just shows us this part of the string, or this part of the string, or this part of the string. And the string stays there. So we don't have to copy it. We don't have to duplicate it. We don't create a new one. We're just looking at the existing string. And we just have a pointer so we can jump straight to it. So there's no time like walking the string to get to that point. No, we know exactly where in the string we go and how much of the data we're able to look at. And we keep that as a, you know, collection of its own. Let's look at that. A string, as you probably know, is a string of characters. So if we treat this string, instead of as a string, we treat it as a span, we could say something like... And someone may have noticed read-only memory there. Don't worry about that for now. We'll say address span. What I've done here is I've essentially created a pointer pointed at the address. Now, I haven't allocated any new memory. Uh, in, on, on the heap. This is just pointing at that. But what I can do is I can sort of change the way that I created my other stuff. So if I instead now say 
I want a read only span of house number, I could say addre uh, address span slice. And slice is one of the methods that is on a span that lets you essentially do a substring, which substring and, and slice, they're all the same thing as the range. So if you're used to ranges, by the way, I've got videos about ranges and indexes in C sharp that you can check out as well. You can just say zero comma four, and it's gonna slice up the same thing. Once we've created this, I can essentially just call this a house number span. And we've essentially created a variable that doesn't allocate anything else on the memory. And I can do the same thing for the others. Now, obviously, I'm not going to print these out, but what I can do is I could validate them. Remember the example we're giving, which is we're supposed to evaluate whether or not these are a legitimate address. And we could do that without actually having to store them as a string. So if I do house number span and then I say street name span and street type span, I should be able to add 5, 15, 9, and 5. And then when I run this and debug it down to that same point, now obviously I'm not using the variables for anything, but I can. But if I do anything more than just looking at the values, then I'm probably gonna convert them into a string and that's not what I wanna do. So in my case, since I'm just looking at specific parts of the value and I don't wanna create a string from it, this is the way that I can avoid that. So if we look at what's stored in memory, you'll see that we have a read-only span here, a read-only span here, and a read-only span here. But remember, a read-only span does not have its own value. So even though it's showing us the record, it's showing us 1640, notice it doesn't have quotes around it. That's because that's not a wholly new string. So these ones are. Also notice that these have a little drop down piece. So let's take a look at this span here. What's in here? You can see that we've got 1640. You can see the values of the characters. So this is the, the ASCII Unicode value numbers and the value here. And then these are the locations inside of my array, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So you'll see I kind of have a character array. The other things to notice here, I have a length value it's storing, which it has to have, and a pointer value. So these are the two things that is stored on the stack. It is stored the pointer, so that's the pointer to my string, and then this is the length. So keep in mind on 1640, I started right at the beginning, which means that that value of the address span if I look at the raw view and I take a look at the pointer, you'll see it ends with ACAC. If I come down to this one, it also ends in ACAC. But if I look at the next value, say the street name, and I come down and I look at the raw view, it will not end in ACAC. It ends in ACB6. And the reason why is it is slightly further along because it's further into the string. So that's essentially what has happened is this has a pointer that points in a little bit further to that string, so just a little, few characters further, and it also knows how long it is, so it knows how many more characters it should look in memory for its values. And so that's essentially what's stored, is two things, a pointer and a length, which is the same kind of thing that you'd store with an array. So essentially we've, like, created a window that is like this array into another string, which is really cool. If you, if you run a benchmark on this or you create, you know, say millions of these or something like that, you'll see massive performance gains. For most of our code, we don't need this. But some of these little op micro optimizations like these are getting made underneath the surface. So we're getting a lot of read-only values, struct values, and other stack allocated stuff that goes away when we leave the method. And it doesn't have to get found and garbage collected later. Because remember, part of the way that they garbage collect is figuring out, is there anything allocated on the heap that I don't have any pointers to? Which means it has to figure out what's there, what doesn't have pointers, and then it has to clear it up, which is a lot of extra work. Whereas when we're on the stack, we just say, hey, what's the current context on the stack? Chop it all off. Done. We're leaving that context. And so that saves us a whole bunch of memory when we do it that way. Let's take a look at an explanation of how all of this is working. So in our initial version, here's what we were looking at. We had a heap allocated value with an address pointed at the location in the heap. When we split our strings off, 
we did this. We created three new points in memory, three new allocations, and we created three new pointers to that. Ignore the, the memory numbers. All the memory numbers are just made up in this, so they don't really matter. But we're pointed to those, those different spots. Great. This is what we created. It duplicates a whole bunch of stuff. We didn't need to do that. Instead, we could go this way. So we've got this big heap of memory, and we've got our stack. We're pointing to it. And we say, wait a minute, we don't need a new one. We can just look at that same memory. So instead, we're going to create pointers to each of those. So we're going to have address number point down here to this first point and know that it goes four. So what we stored was the original address plus zero with a length of four. And then the street name. We have stored the pointer with an increase of five to the address and then a length of nine. And then for the street type, we need to go even further. So we have stored the address, but 15 further along, and we stored a length of five. And essentially then we're just, you know, looking through our binoculars at the existing memory. So notice no extra memory put in the heap and it's all over here on the stack. So when you leave a method, when you leave the context that you're in on this, uh, in your code execution, it actually just takes everything on the stack and that's just gone. So we don't have to worry about coming back to find it later and you just get this. Now, we talked about all of this as part of working with strings. Now, remember, this isn't exclusive to strings. We can also do this with arrays. So if you have an array uh, and you want to grab sections of it for some reason, say you're paging or something like that, and you need to get like, what's the current ones? You can grab the same thing. I will also comment to you that these values, so notice I'm storing them as read-only spans of characters. We could obviously read-only spans of integers or anything else. When we use these values, it's important to not turn them back into strings or, or, or anything like that. Because if you do, if you call dot two string on this, it reallocates the string. I've made videos on this concept before. Return back the actual values that you've got. So if we had this inside of a method instead of a main, and we were returning this back, you should return back a read-only span if that's what you've got, or three of them if that's what you were working with, right? And the reason why is that any user that calls this can use the spans and not worry about having to allocate. If they need to turn the span into a string for some reason, say they needed to right line it, they can decide which ones they want to allocate. Uh, I've had people ask me before, and I'll have a video about this at some point. If When I do, I'll put a card up there for it. When you're returning a value, return something useful. So I see, I've seen a lot of people make this mistake in their code. They'll do things like returning back an enumerable when they have an array or a list. And I sit there and I go, but if you returned an array and someone two lists your array, they're converting your array into a, into a list, which is silly when they probably could have used the array, but you didn't tell them that's what it was. And if you return back an I enumerable and the user maybe thinks that they needed that they could two list it again. And, and it's just pointless allocations when you could just give them the type and they would know, oh, it's got a length because I know that's a list and I can check that. I can check the count. I can check the length, whether it's a, uh, an, a list or an array. And they can use things like maybe they want to sort it. They know that they can get away with that. They don't have to change it. There's more information you can give to a user if you give them the actual value you're returning. Now, when you are accepting a value, you want to accept the minimal thing you can. So that's why I tell people in your parameter list, you should accept an I enumerable if all you're going to do is enumerate the you know set one time because you don't need anything else. Now, if you need it to have certain properties, like its length or something like that, and you want to be able to enumerate it multiple times, you could, for example, ask for an I list. And that makes much more sense from a parameter standpoint, because then someone calling you can give you the right thing. You obviously didn't want an enumerable, because you were going to enumerate it twice. And that is pretty bad to do with an I enumerable if it is not actually a collection underneath. With read-only spans, make sure that you are returning back just the read-only span. Don't return back something else. Don't turn it into a string. If you call to string on this, it will allocate. So if I say dot to string, that is going to allocate a new string on the heap, and that is a mistake. There should be a warning. I'm surprised Writer isn't giving me a warning about this because it's really smart about that. Hey chatters, thanks for watching this episode of Dev Chatter. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to click the like and subscribe button down below and catch us on our live streams. You'll find links to that as well. We also have a Discord that you can consider joining where you can chat with me and the rest of the Dev Chatter community outside of our normal streams and videos. Take care and happy coding everyone.